Welcome. This will be um, EduPsych Theory for Python Hackers. This is a half hour talk by Mel Chua. We're going to try to have about five to eight minutes at the end for questions. Um, so, Mel Chua. Uh, hi, everyone. So, welcome to EduPsych Theory for Python Hackers. This is a very laptops and cord talk. There are slides around the web, and there'll be a lot of points where I'll say it's Wikipedia time, so if you want to look something up or follow a resource down, because what I'm about to do is to try to cram about two years of graduate school education classes into approximately 20 minutes. So there's going to be a lot that we cover very, very quickly, and there's going to be a lot that we don't cover, but I'll go, there's a link. So uh, my name is Matt. And in between bouts of academia, I've been spending a lot of time wandering around sort of the hacking world, the coding world, the open source world, the Python world. And the reason I went back to academia was because there was a bug I wanted to fix, was that classrooms looked like that, and not like this, and not like the sorts of really core hacking, messing around with things, communities that we all know and love. And there's this giant cultural gulf between the academic world and the world that we know here. And my belief is that the folks here at PyCon are doing it right. That in particular, for one example, uh, test-driven development. Many of us would probably be familiar with this. Uh, that's a doc test for a function that returns a factorial of a number. And there's a test for it. And I was taught when I started programming that when you're writing code, you figure out what you want the code to do first, then you write a test to make sure whatever code you're going to write is performing the function you want it to perform, then you write the code. And when we design curriculum, we should do exactly the same thing. So a lot of people make the mistake of starting with the pedagogy first, of going, that would be a really cool activity to do with students. So pause, step back, first figure out the content the objective you want, right? Then write the test. How will you assess that students are able to achieve the objective you want? Then figure out the pedagogy of what activity you want them to do to get there. Understanding by Design is a lovely book if you want to learn a bit more about that approach. And if you're trying to figure out, well, what, what this content thing? Bloom Taxonomy is a handy dandy list of words that you can use. Uh, it goes up in a hierarchy. Do you want students to memorize and remember things? which is fairly easy and quick. And sometimes it's not a bad thing because there's only so many times you can say, well, square brackets are list and curly ones are dictionaries over and over again before you just want them to know it. Do you want them to be able to apply things in a step-by-step -step tutorial as following instructions? Do you want them to be able to evaluate, you know, two or two approaches? Which one do you think is better? Why? Do you want them to be able to create things? And the thing about the taxonomy is that the stuff at the top, we usually think of as better, but it's not necessarily better. It takes more time, and it's really hard to do the things at the top unless you've done some things at the bottom first. So back to the whole cultural gulf between the two. One of the things that, again, as partners as you already know, is that the world is socially constructed, and some people in school have a very hard time understanding this. But we already know that because, well, why is the Python language the way it is? It's not because some higher power from above ordained it. Well, uh, it kind of is, but they're called maintainers. <laughs> and they're humans, and we can see them talking in a mailing list, and we can see their commit messages, and we can see them going back and forth. And so we have this idea that the world is just as hackable as our technologies are. And that's a very, very powerful viewpoint to have. So, so here's the thing. We need to come up with some sort of translation between the two worlds, because what happens when I went back to graduate school and I started teaching again, and I was talking about, oh my gosh, you know, in, in these communities of makers, in the open source world, in the Python community, we learn and it's fun and it's wonderful, and can I do this in my classroom, please? They went, well, well, what is it you do there? And, oh, we make things and it's fun. Like, oh, oh, you're just playing. And, and so I need to find ways to describe it in words that they would understand. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. So, so let's go through this a little bit. Accidental learning. It's a fancy word for we didn't plan it ahead of time. 
But this is a, you hang out on an IOC channel, people are talking, things might come up, things that you didn't expect to learn about that day. And this is the kind of hap uh, thing that happens in our world all the time. Right? You're in a conference, you're milling around, you meet people, the accidental learning or authentic experiences is another really useful phrase. Um, communities of practice. PyCon is a community of practice. Communities of practice is another like, really big theoretical construct that a lot of education people use. And it is within a domain, a community of people, so within the domain of programming. We are a community of people that share the practice of programming in Python. Or within the domain of Python web framework, the Django community is a community that shares the practice of using the Django framework. And so if you think of the community of practice, it's actually a learning entity, and cognitive apprenticeships are how learning happens inside communities of practice. And if you think about a shop floor of a traditional handcraft, like wood, woodworking, or delivering babies, or what have you, as an apprentice, you'd see two different pathways. One is that you'd see the pathway from raw product to finished product. But you would also see the pathway from new apprentice to master. And it's not just one pathway. It's I see the more experienced apprentices ahead of me. I see the journeyman ahead of them. And I don't just see one master. I see 50, I see 20, I see 1,000 masters. So I get the idea that there are many different kinds of mastery, many different kinds of people. It's not a linear route I'm on, and it's not I'm comparing myself to him or her, but it's what kind of master will I become? What does it mean for me to have mastery in this domain? And the modeling, coaching, scaffolding, and fading, because these communities of practice and these sort of apprentice shops are in our head, when we're programming, it's not like we can see our you know, bug fixing in your brain is not quite as visible as let me start as drawer in this wood. And so modeling, coaching, scaffolding, and fading are four things that, as people who teach, we can think about. So modeling is doing the task yourself so that the learner can see it. Coaching is standing on the sidelines and giving them real-time feedback as they're attempting that task themselves. Scaffolding is designing tasks so that they, they take on a little bit and then successively more. So for instance, the first time someone is running a program and it crashes, you might model, this is how you submit a bug report. The next time, you might scaffold that a little bit. You'd open up Bugzilla and then say, you asked me type the subject line before, why don't you come up with a subject line now? All right, now that you've come up with a subject line, let's type the body together. And over time, you give them more and more responsibility. And after that, you start to fade slowly until they're doing the entire task on their own. And that link at the bottom, if you want to learn way more about cognitive apprenticeship, is a paper I wrote on cognitive apprenticeship case studies in open communities. So what happens when you go through cognitive apprenticeship is you progress from novice to expert. And the Dreyfus model of skill acquisition is a framework you can use to think about that progression. And it's the insight here that the Dreyfus brothers had was not that people progress from novice to expert, which is kind of obvious. But or perhaps equally obvious is that when you are at any given stage, it's very hard to tell and remember what the other stages are like. So if you are an advanced beginner, you've kind of forgotten what it's like to be a novice, and you have no idea what it's like to be proficient or an expert. And so what that means is that the world looks very different to very different types of people. So for instance, if you are proficient or an expert or you know, pretty comfortable with Python working in communities remotely, our see channel might look like a place so you might get out faster, Right? Find tasks faster. These are all happy, happy tools for us. Uh, and we see them as things that can bring the, the little green people on the outskirts into the little purple people on the inside of our community and learn. It will be wonderful. And uh, the, the green people on the outskirts don't necessarily see it that way, but they might think this. We will not talk to you until you use the strange new tool. Stop asking me what to do and go away. To a corner no one has touched for months. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not really the impression we're trying to give them. But why do they think that? So, Pierre Dre. One of the reasons why, so th this talk alone, if you can not read Pierre Dre and get this, it's worth it, because I had to read the original translation from the French and ah. Uh. So, Pierre Dre has two ideas. Well, he has a lot more ideas, but the two I'm going to talk about here is assimilation and accommodation. 
Uh, a simulation is when you can add new information to the mental schemas you already have. And a combination is when you have enough data, it doesn't really quite fit that, you've got to refactor it. And we have a really good example over here. <laughs> right? And so let's think about that, right? There are some people that even as Python 3 was out, kept on using Python 2.5, 6, 7, and so you had two parallel streams. And so when you have students, some of them are going to keep on wanting to think the same way they've been thinking until it really, 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 really no longer works, and others are going to be early adopters. And telling them that that is a switch that they're making in paradigms is something you can do to make them more conscious that that's the process that they're going through. Um, but, you know, back to our earlier image, so perceiving it the wrong way can actually scare people away. And the Dreyfus model talks about what uh, context, uh, what, what are novices missing? Novices are missing context. If you're just beginning to learn how to cook, you really want a cookbook that says, this is a chicken, a chicken is a bird. <laughs> this is what you do with it. Turn on the oven. On the other hand, if you're an experienced chef, you can go and compete in Iron Chef and say, sardines! <laughs> and you go, ah! Oh! Because you have the context of how to improvise within that world. And so the resources that work for an expert or someone higher up on a day for skill acquisition scale aren't going to work for a novice. And so that's another thing, like looking at where your students are, what they need, where they feel they are, and how much context they can handle so you can scaffold them appropriately. So, quick break. Assessment, because I was thinking about food, and formative versus summative assessment is a good aside to put in here. Formative assessment is like tasting food as you're cooking it to make sure it's going to turn out okay. Summative assessment is tasting the food at the end once you've served it and it's done. Summative assessment is the kind of assessment that usually happens in school, so you get a grade at the end of the semester. Formative assessment is the kind of assessment that happens in here. You got conversations and things are evolving, you give people feedback, you review their code. And so when you talk to educators and they say, well, how are you going to assess your students? And the answer is, well, I don't, I don't want to grade them. You can say, well, they'll, they'll have uh, many opportunities for informal, formative assessment with experienced members of the community, and it'll sound good. <laughs> so back to grade first. One of the things that that dispels is the myth that you can't contribute until you're good enough. Uh, there are still things that novices can do if they are scaffolded appropriately. And two things that can help you think about that is, in cognitive apprenticeships within communities of practice, there's the idea of a zone of proximal development and the idea of legitimate peripheral participation, and they're related. So proximal development is so here's the thing that I can already do. And then there are things on the other end that I can never do, no matter how much help I get, at this point in time. And in the middle of that, there's the stuff that I can do if and only if someone else helps me. That is the zone of proximal development. And so bike riding, it's when you're at that stage where you can kind of wobble on a bike if, you, if your brother like, kind of hang on to the seat from behind. And so what's the equivalent in the Python community? It might look like pair program, it might look like code review, it might look like any sort of interaction between experienced people and less experienced people. And one of the cool things about the zone of proximal development is that you don't need experience versus less experience. Peers can create zones of proximal development for each other. But it's the enablement that an extra person beside you or with you online creates. Legitimate peripheral participation is what the name for allowing people to contribute without being in the core already. So there are mission critical tasks and then nobody, things that nobody really cares about. And the legitimate peripheral participation opportunities come with the jobs that would be really, really cool if we could do this, but none of the core people have time for it. And so that's a lot, a lot of the Google Summer of Code projects. So I fall into that category. A lot of good projects for students and classes fall into that category. If you have things that your core community would love to see fixed, so they'll actually help people that are coming in to fix it, but they're not so vital that if they don't fix it, then the build gets delayed because this one student couldn't figure out how to write the code. That's a great opportunity. And now, 
switching gears for a bit, going back to our first example of task-driven development, this is also a good example of behaviorist thinking. The fact that, you know, we've got that little function that says we will test these students, they will produce an output, it will show us the true and accurate mentality of how much they know. That is a fair assumption to make, but it's an assumption you should know you're making. And so what I'm going to do uh, for the sort of grand finale of this, well, semi-grand finale of this, is to go through 50 years of cognitive paradigms and teaching and learning very, very quickly. And if you want the less abridged version, um, there are resources there. So this is 50 years of educational psychology history on one page. In the beginning, there was behaviorism, which is the carrot and stick stimulus response thinking. Uh, we have a student, they're a black box, we poke at them, they give us an output, it will be the correct answer, we hope. If not, we'll poke at them some more and kind of beat them with a stick and wave a carrot in front of them, and then they'll give the correct answer. And sometimes we go, oh, no, 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 behaviorism is bad, it's outmoded and outdated, but it's really useful. For instance, the Boston Python workshop, we was just coding back to teach books. Anytime we talk about automating learning, automating scoring, we're taking a behaviorist mentality. Right? So this says, write this code, type it in, press the button, did you get the right answer, yes, no. So it's not an evil thing, it's a very, very useful tool, but it's something to be conscious of. Then there are people that want, oh well, the behaviorists think that inside the brain is a black box, but but what goes inside there is actually really important. And so, how do we structure material? How do we store in our memory? How do we organize things so that they're easier for people to learn? And a really good example of that is actually you folks. Why do so many people like programming in Python as opposed to other languages? It fits in your brain pretty nicely. You can read the code, it makes sense, as opposed to, I had the program in assembly back in the day and that was, didn't fit my brain quite so well. And so using Python is already using cognitive schemas and working with people who value the use of good cognitive schemas. Then moving into the situative domain, people were like, oh, that stuff is happening in your brain, you're responding to input, but really this stuff happens in a community. Learning happens in a context. Knowledge only really makes sense if other people know it too and validate it. And that's a lot of what we were talking about with cognitive apprenticeship earlier. But another good example of that is Sugar Lab. So this is a learning environment for kids written in Python where they can um, play, play with different games for learning. But one of the cool things is when we're talking about modeling, coaching, scaffolding, and fading, that's also built into the design of the activity. So you can play the game, and then at another level, you can click on a little gear thing and make your own abacus, and at another level, you can click on another button and see the Python code and work on it. And so there's different levels of scaffolding, and you can see the work of multiple people and show your code with others, and that starts getting out of the, I'm a person on my computer working alone, and into the, I'm a person working in a broader community, connecting with other people, socially constructing the world with them. So in a parallel thread, to that timeline of behaviorist um, cognitive thinking and then situated learning were the ideas of different theories of motivation. I just want to go through a few of them really quickly. One is self-efficacy, which is the idea of how much do you believe you can do this? And that is, in rank order, the thing they found affected self-efficacy the most. So if you care about making people believe they can do things, this is the list you want to pay attention to. So the most impactful thing is doing it, because if you did it before, you can probably do it again. The second one is seeing people do it, people that look like you. The converse of that is if you see people that look like you fail at it, then you start thinking, oh, maybe I can't do it either. And the third one, social persuasion, is other people coming up and saying, you can do this, you should try this, you should come, you should come to this talk, you should go to this tour, you should give another talk. And the interesting thing is that those three things override your physical body. So if you have butterflies in your stomach and you're really scared about hitting the enter key, but the people beside you are going, yeah, you can do this, and you're asking people around you to succeed, then you're really likely to actually believe you can take that leap. Attribution theory, another thing. Do you walk into the room thinking that my talent in coding is innate? Or do you walk into the room thinking, it's a muscle and if I exercise it, I'll get better? 
and the people that are really good are good because they work very hard. And so what attitude do your students come into the room with, and what attitude as a teacher do you project? And this is a really good example here, because I think people that come to things like PyCon are coming because they want to learn things, because they know that it's not a magical talent we're born with. We gain this through exposure and working with others that are interested. Then there's um, motivation. And moving from a motivation, which is I don't care, through other people make me do it, I'll do it because it's good for me and it'll help me get a good job, into I think it's really, really cool, which is for the most part where we want people to end up, can be influenced by making increasing autonomy, relatedness, and competence. So autonomy is the freedom you have to decide what you're going to do. Relatedness is how closely tied is this to something I already care about. And competence is self-efficacy, as we talked about earlier. How good do I think I am at doing it? Not how good I am I at doing it, but how good do I think I am? So if you want to increase the stuff on the left, turn the sliders up for the stuff on the right. And so now with that, this, this paragraph should now start making a little bit more sense. So why do I do this? Why, why am I talking about these kinds of things? And the thing is because we can only see a little bit of the world. We can only see a little bit of what students do and what they think. And as teachers, we have a lot of privilege. And we don't necessarily see what our students are assuming about themselves or why things may not be working for them yet. We tend to teach the way we learn. And so sometimes we think, oh, well, the way I teach is the way it should be taught. Or maybe the way I teach is better than the way they teach in schools, but clearly it's the way it should be taught. And that's necess not necessarily true. When you're a student, the first couple of steps do not feel like progress. You're doubting yourself, you're scared, and you might be quiet, but underneath the silence, stuff is happening inside. Reason is stirring in the background. And it's very important that confirmation that you belong to a community starts when you begin to try, rather than being an end goal that you try to get to. Once you take the first step, you already belong. And that's all I had. Um, time for questions? Okay, if you've got questions, we've got a microphone there, and uh, we've got a microphone here, so. Well, I was just going to ask, can you go back two slides? I missed the full quote on that. Uh, uh, this one? Yes. Okay. Uh, hi, yeah. Um, first, I want to thank you. Uh, that was... Sorry. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. So I want to thank you. That was really interesting and not at all what I thought I would be learning coming to PyCon. So it was an accidental learning opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> and um, c uh, could you recommend a, a book that we could... Come again? Uh, could you recommend a book the, the, uh, on this topic, like some kind of pop, uh, uh, pop psych book? Well, uh, which topic? Oh, educational psychology? Like, it's, it's a really interesting field, uh, which I know nothing about except now this. Okay. Um, and it, it sounds quite big, but uh, I don't want to do the graduate school either. <laughs> All right. So, uh, if, I, if I could only recommend one book, I would come, I believe it's called Theories of Development by Crane, C-R-A-I-N. And I can, I can write that down for you afterwards if you'd like. And what that is, it's a snapshot of individual researchers that have developed, so Banderas and the Dreckers and the couple of things we went through in there, and it gives five-page summaries of all the very complicated papers. Thank you. And it's lovely. Okay, any other questions? Hello? Yeah, thanks again for doing this talk. I was just curious, uh, what, what are some of the next steps for you? What do you think, uh, do you think you can a implement a more, basically a teaching methodology more based on uh, the free and open source movement in your own teaching? Well, I'm interested in 2.5 things. <laughs> but one, one is, 
so, so the reason I was giving this talk is because I'm assuming that y'all are people who do the Python thing and care about teaching, and I wanted to try to give you some language to explain what you're doing to validate it in the world of professional schooling, and to go and be able to say, this is a great thing to have your class do, this is a great thing to have you know, as part of a curriculum. It's not something that should be relegated to just after-school clubs or just playing around, because putting it into more mainstream schooling would give more people access to it instead of just the people that have the resources and both time and equipment to play around with it on the side. And so that's one of the things. And, and so if you are interested in trying to help explain the project that you're doing to educational institutions, I'd be very happy to help with that. Another thing I'm interested in is going in the opposite direction, working with teachers that are interested in working with folks like you and bringing things in the classroom. So Jeff and Steve up in the front row are brilliant examples. I wish I could clone them. So Jeff does <laughs> K-12 and Steve does college. And how do they move in the opposite direction and get to know what it's like to work in these sorts of projects and communities? And the point five is that a number of people have been trying to bug me to write this up in longer form as a bi-directional translation for both sides. And I'm, I'm not sure if like, more than three people are actually interested in that, but that may be something to do once I um, finish up my classes next semester. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, oh, sorry. sorry. Um, so if there was one thing that you could get you know, the average computer science teacher to change or stop doing or start doing, what would it be? It would be... Uh, it would be working on the content. A lot of teachers, their learning objectives are filled with, we have to hit standard X, Y, Z, and there's 20 learning objectives, and we have to go through all the chapters of a textbook. And there we go. There we go. And so it's a very linear thing because you need to have a predefined outcome. But loosening that up and changing things so that your goal is, let me have students become confident wandering in an unknown world. Um, being comfortable being uh, productively lost is a phrase that I actually use a lot. Have them be comfortable being productively lost. So even if they don't hit specific bits of content or specific bits of material, but they're comfortable moving around improvising, and that's the learning objective, that's the one thing I would like to see change, but it's a huge, huge change, and it's a very risky change for a lot of people. So it's a hard one. Okay, any more questions? I think that's okay. Thank that's you very much. Time.